the way you'll know whether I've preached it properly or not is that it is offensive, it is scandalous. And it's the love of God that is scandalous and offensive. Hopefully not me. If I am offensive, I apologise in advance. I'm going to try not to be offensive. I'm, ju- I'm just as offended by this as you are, I assure you. So let me, let me start why we're going to be offended, okay? Because the Bible tells us that there are only two ways of trying to get right with God. And everybody fits into one of those two ways. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to speak the scandalous offence out in two different ways, okay? I'm going to say it in a slightly like, I'm going to ease you in with one phrase, and then I'm going to come with things that are going to offend you, okay? So I'm going to try and work you in. Are you ready? Okay? This is it. Uh, first truth about how we get right with God. Okay? Ready? Number one, you can try and get right with God by either receiving something or achieving something. Do you get that? I've said that to you sometimes before, okay? So, being in with God is not achieved, it is received. In fact, that kind of phrase that you lot could say after me, we're ready. Being right with God is not something that is. But. You're hearing A's on, isn't it, Brenda? Brilliant. Yeah, Stephen at the back. Lovely. Okay, we'll just double check. Here we go. Being in with God is not something that is. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, you can either try and achieve things with God. You work hard, you bring your kids right, you pay your taxes, you pay your way, you're not as bad as the people down the road, you're much more forgiving, you're all of those things, and then when you turn up at the gate of heaven, God says, well, in me, can you come? You're just the kind of fellow I like. That's one strategy to be in with God. The other strategy is, well... You have to receive it because you know you don't hit the mark, you fail the grades... God is going to have to do something to get you into relationship with him. And the message of the Bible is this. It can only be the second one. So if you're at the first one, you're trying to achieve something, you're going down a dead-end street. You can only get in with God by receiving it. Being right with God is not something that is... But... Right, now that was the nice, friendly way of saying it, okay? Here's the offensive way of saying it. Good people go to hell... Bad people go to heaven. That's a bit close to the bone, isn't it? Good people quite often go to hell because they're good people. I can remind you to take no pleasure in talking about hell. It's not a plaything for me. Good people, because they are good people, go to hell. And some bad people because they've realised they're bad people, they get a chance to go to heaven. That's what the Bible is arguing in these verses here. And it is scandalous, isn't it? It's offensive. It is unsettling. You see, in verse 30, we can see it there, can't we, chapter 9, what then shall we say that the Gentiles, you know, the the non-religious Jewish people, those who were of the nations, who did not pursue righteousness, remember, being right with God, have obtained it. They don't don't give a rip about God. They've lived as if they're in control of their life. They're leading their life their own jolly way. And yet now, now that Jesus has come, they can be in. But what about the others? For Israel, they're the religious people, the people who genuinely will find sincerely, they try hard, they do the best, they pay the taxes, they pay the way, they pursue the law of righteousness, have not gone in. Because they're good. Why does it say that? Because they pursued it not by faith as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling block. Now that word stumbling there, I'm told in the Greek word, is where we get the word scandalous from. It is a road that you walk down and you try and really hard, try and really hard, try and really hard, and then boom, you stumble over and fall flat. And it's similar, it's where we get the word scandalous from. It is absolutely scandalous. The people who are trying to earn and do the right thing and get in with God, they fall flat on their face. And yet people who seem to realise they know they can't get in with God, they're the ones who, according to this, well, they don't get put to shame. They're full of trust. And they actually get to know all of God's blessing. You see, religious people hit a dead end. It's a stumbling stone. It's offensive. And can I tell you, you know, sometimes, why did the Jewish people kill Jesus? This is it. It's because he said to them, you can't get in with God by your good deeds. You need something else? They said, we're going to kill you. 
So we shouldn't be surprised that when you explain it, this is what the Bible calls grace. It's the most beautiful word in the human language. It's about receiving something that you did not and could not earn on your own. But when you hear grace unpacked, to start off with, it makes you want to kill someone. Please don't kill me. It's the message here in the Bible. So please let me be clear. Some people will say, do you know what? I am bankrupt, I've got no hope, I've messed up, I'm not worthy, I'm undeserving. And they will be given a righteousness because they're humble enough to ask. And then there are other people who say, do you know what? I'm alright, I'll muddle on through, I do my bits, I pay my way, I try to achieve, I'm very sincere. And they're out. Why? Why? This is a hard reality. Why? It's because they're clinging to an idea that you can save yourself. You can get in by yourself. And that's hardwired into us, isn't it? It's why the X Factor show is so popular. We were talking about this when we were doing an assembly with the kids in Parkland this week. That's why a few of you were smiling, weren't we? How is it that you get to perform on the X Factor? Is it by being useless? No, it's by being what? Talented, good-looking, shiny, happy, smiley. People like you. You have something to offer. You're on. How is it that you get into the England squad? Well, actually, this is up for debate. It's supposed to be on the basis of merit. You know, if you can play, you're in. If you kick a ball like I do, you've got no chance. You're out. This, this kind of, if you've got something to offer and can earn it and achieve it, you're in. That's hardwired into us. And you see, for people like you and me and people that we know all around us, people think God wants us to earn something off of him. Now, can I tell you, that isn't good news. Not if you're somebody like me. It's good advice, but not good news, because I can't do enough to earn off God. And it's no wonder people don't want to come to church, because we're very good as church sitters, aren't we? That though, even if you're somebody who's a believer, who's trusted in Jesus, and you are a card-carrying Christian... You can still communicate to people around you, can't you, that, well, I trust in Jesus, but really I'm in because I've contributed a bit myself. I've sorted myself out, you know. No wonder people don't want to come to church. God hates that. He hates the idea of your own self-salvation project. You can't get in by it. No religious people who are trusting in that will ever, 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 ever get right with God. Do you get that, please? Oh, I wish you did. You're probably beginning to understand it up here, but would you get it down here? Let's see whether we can push it down here a little bit more. And to help, here's three reasons why religious people are stuck if they try and trust in their religion. I'm sorry if this is a shock to you. You come to church and you expect to hear, be good. I'm telling you, you start thinking be good and you're stuck. That doesn't mean that God's not interested in the way you live, but if you try to relate to God by the way you live, you're stuck. Here we go. First one here, we can stick it up now if you don't mind. Oops. There we go. Why religious people are in danger? That's a, another translation for stuffed. Yeah. Brilliant. Firstly, they miss Jesus, verses 1 through to 4. They miss Jesus. Now, apparently in the newspaper, not so long ago, there's an article in there about how they're about to stop parents teaching kids to drive. Okay? You know, so it's not just to make sure that we pay extra money for the lessons. It's to stop kids... A parents teaching their kids how to drive. It's not because during the lesson they have accidents because they're screaming at each other. Apparently, studies have been done to show that if you get taught by your parents how to drive, no matter how sincere and how focused and how well-meaning the parent is, the majority of the time, whatever the parent's bad habits in driving are, they get passed up. So, the parent is sincerely teaching the child, but they're sincerely teaching the child wonky stuff. Stuff that is wrong. And you see here, what we find, oh yeah, it's interesting, that ends up with crashes, that's why they want to stop it, it kills you. So you understand what the thing is, you can be sincere about something, but you can be sincerely wrong, and it kills people. And that's what it says there in verses 1 through to 10. Brothers, my heart's desire, says the Apostle Paul, and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. I want them to come and be in a right relationship with God. I want them in heaven. I want them to know him now. For I can testify about their zealousness for God. They're very sincere. But their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. 
Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So do you get this? They're teaching each other that the point of the law, the point of rules and regulations in the Bible, is to get you in with God. That's wrong. If ever you've been told that, that is wrong. I pray God it wasn't from this pulpit. It is wrong. You see here that it says in verse 4, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for all who believe. So you're on a train called being good. And you're being as good as you can. Do you know what the destination is? The destination is Jesus. Because along that journey on the train of law, you realise, I've messed up. I'm a failure. I can't keep it. I keep on wrecking it. I'm not in control. I've sinned. I'm guilty. I'm in danger. So if you go on that train, on that journey, it's supposed to lead you to somebody who can help you in your predicaments. And that was the point. But they, what they did was, the Jewish people, the religious people, they, they sort of shanghai the trains. So the train's going this way, the end of it is to take them to the, the Lord Jesus. And what they did is that, you know, hostage situation, counter-terrorism unit, in they come, because they're steering the train around this way to the destination that we can get us in. They miss Jesus. And there are plenty of people who sit in churches and when we talk about the beauty and the wonder of Jesus and how patient he is, they sit there and say, Amen! And they hear about how gracious and loving he is. Brilliant! And they hear about how he's very generous and forgiving. Oh, I think that's good. And they hear about you know, giving away money and, and helping people who are in need. Yes! And as they sit there listening to all of that, they basically say, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. I must be able to get myself in with God. When actually, that isn't the case. Let me give you an example of this. I need to show this to you because uh, some of you have heard this, but I know many of you haven't. I just think it's such a vivid example. It is the story of a guy called John Wesley who wrote loads of songs. He ended up being a minister. Now, he was a top fellow. In fact, yesterday, just to sharpen up the story a bit for those of you you may have heard it before. I downloaded a, like, a little story of what happened to this guy. He went to Oxford. He was about, uh, he was just a holy moly. He tried to do everything right. This is some of the things that he would do. He said, I watched against all sin, whether in word or deed. I began to aim at it and pray for it, inward holiness, so that now, quote, doing so much and living so good a life, I doubted not that I was a good Christian. Do you get what he's saying? So he was in a holiness club. Anybody here in a holiness club? That was how serious he was. He had a big list of things they would and wouldn't do. One of them, one of the tests which always humbled me was, it wasn't just, have I prayed enough? It's, was I enjoying prayer enough? enough? So every time he, he wasn't enjoying prayer, prayer enough, he would, well, he would get down on his knees and pray some more. Loads of stuff like that. Big, big lists. And then he was finding it very difficult. He realised that he was stuffing up, so he said, I cried to God for help and resolve not... Pro- not to prolong the time of obeying him as I never had done before and by, by my, uh, sorry, and by my continued endeavour to keep his whole law inward and outward to the uttermost of my power I was persuaded that I should be accepted of him and that I was even then in a state of salvation do you get what he was saying? by what I do and by my power and my effort I am in in fact in 1730 he began to visit prisons he assisted the poor he went uh, to the sick in the town and doing what other good I could by my presence and my little fortune to the bodies and souls of men yet when after continuing some years in this course I apprehended myself to be near death I could not find that all this gave me any comfort or any assurance of acceptance with God and at this I was then not a little surprised not imagining I had been all this time building on sand you see, sooner or later it testified to his heart that he was stopped. No matter what he did, there was still more to be done. And he just could not do it. He just couldn't achieve it. In fact, elsewhere, this is what he said. He said, I was convinced that it was my unbelief and I needed true living faith. I thought I needed more and hadn't got enough. But the problem was that I had saving faith, but that it was based on the wrong thing. Where had he put his faith and his confidence? What was his way of standing before God and knowing that he was right with God? He'd got a lot of faith, but where was it located? 
the things he was doing, could we put that another way, that's dead rights? Run into somebody else, put a trap on the right. Obedience to the Lord, yeah, the things he was doing. Who was his saviour? Himself. You see that? He was his own saviour. Now I've got a piece of paper there, I need to read to you. Where is it? It's gone. Okay. Because we need to realise that in the Bible, sin is not breaking rules so much. And you think, hold on, sin is breaking a no. Sin is putting yourself in the place of God as saviour, lord and judge. Just as Wesley was doing. Just as those religious people we've been reading about. And just as all of us do in one form or another. But there's two ways you can do it. You can do it by being very, very bad and saying to God, and I will run my life my own way, do my very own thing, and that is it. I will be my own Lord, my Saviour, I will set my own course, I am in charge. You can do that. That's one way of running away from God and saying I am God. Another way of doing it is by saying I'm going to be very, very good. I'm going to be my own saviour. I will be so good that God has to let me in. And that is what he was doing. And of course that appeals to us, doesn't it? According to the Bible, each one of us is in a a committed relationship with a project of self-salvation. To use God to get power over him to say, you must have me in your gang. It's as simple as that. And so the religious person loses out on, on God's grace because of their goodness. You get that? It is because of it. It is not our sins when we're religious that create the barrier between him and us. It is our pride. So here's another way of saying it. It is not our wrongdoing but our righteousness that keeps us from God's grace. Do you get that? It's incredibly powerful and frightening, isn't it? Have you seen how we're all full of faith, we're all full of trust, we're all depending on something. And quite often what we depend on cuts us off from God if it isn't Him Himself. And so we find it kills you. If you're religious, it can seem so right, it can seem that you're building a good self-image, that you're hard-working, that you're respectable, that you've got moral virtue, that you're a member of a good people, you can feel superior, you can justify yourself. But it kills you, says Jesus, because you've missed me, he says. I'm the only one who can get you in with God. You need me to pay your way. But the problem is, if you're somebody who's trying to pay your own way, it feels so right and it can put you in such a dangerous spiritual position. It really can. I can get you in, says Jesus. It's that easy. That brings us on to the second point, doesn't it? Because the second point says, it's too easy. That's one of the reasons why religious people are interested in Jesus because it is too easy. Now, I, uh, so I've told some of you about the marathon monks. Can you remember the marathon monks? Do you remember them? They're these not of super spiritual dudes in the Far East and some, you know, temple thing on a mountain, you know, with clouds around it. And the marathon monks, what they want to do is achieve righteousness and enlightenment and connection with God and they do it by killing themselves. Not literally the verse. In fact, some of them have died trying it. They go on this marathon 1,000 day escapade. This is what they do. I've got it written down, okay? It starts off with a 100 day term called the Kehogi Can't pronounce that. Well, they just sort of learn about mountains, they surf it, they go up and down. They have 80 pairs of straw sandals that are woven together for this first 100 day term. And when they run out, they just get sore feet. But the basic rules of that first 100 days is, uh, during the running that they do around the mountain, they have to have a hat and a robe on that can't be taken off. They're not allowed to deviate from the course. There's no stopping for rest or refreshment. They've got to attend all the required services and prayers and do all the chants properly and all that kind of thing. Okay, that's the first hundred days and then it begins to pick up pace. After that, the second hundred days, they have to run a marathon every day. Fancy that? For a hundred days. They start very late at night, they finish early in the morning, but when they finish in the morning, do they go off for a sleep? Oh no, they have to go and chant and pray and bathe and eat and do all that kind of thing all through the day, and they're off at the same time the next night. And at some point in that term, they have to perform the next phase, uh, which is two marathons every day. And then it so goes on. The next period of 300 days, they continue to run 
a, a marathon which is 26 miles every day until the pace quickens where they do it for 200 consecutive days. After completing that, they're up to about the 700th day, they have to survive something for a nine day period that they put themselves through. Do you know I'm getting bored of reading that? you get the point? And yet there's something in there as you listen back and wow, are they great. To me, I just read that and think, go out and get a job. That's me, but whoa, there's something really like, wow, and oh, they're so tough, they've achieved it, they're, they're in. And that's what religious people like. That's what we like. We like this idea that there's like this higher spiritual path that if I can do it, I am in. If I can do some great thing, then I'll be in. I'll feel like I've achieved. I'm going to feel like I'm deserving it. I'll feel like I've got God by the short and curly. Now, because I've done this, he has to do what I want him to do and to do, and he has to bless me. Yet yeah, here we see in these next verses, in verses uh, 5 through to 14, it's just incredibly humbling because he says you can't do that and it's not that hard. So I want it to be hard. I want to feel like I've earned it and I'm in. And what's he say? No, well, the Old Testament always promised that you only ever got in by trusting in Jesus. The man who does these things will live by them. That's a, a quote out of the Old Testament about how only people who trust in God's promise will be in. But the righteous say that it is by faith. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend up to heaven? In other words, like the, mountain monk, uh, the marathon monks legging up a mountain. If I go high enough, I'll, I'll find a way to get in with God. Or who will descend into the deep? You know, maybe I can find an answer to get right with God by digging down. No, you don't have to do that. Verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. I realise some of you find it difficult to talk, but actually, you don't really. Can I show you? Really easy. Talk. Oh, you your tongue and it comes out. It's that easy to get in with God. Can you see that there? All you've got to do is wiggle your mouth. Look, it says that. Okay? Verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that easy. All you've got to do is say, God help me. In fact, I don't know, you know, even if you're half asleep now, you can say, God help me. Be my saviour. I confess you with my mouth, you're my only hope. And in my heart, I'm standing on your promises. I transferred my faith from myself to you. That easy. There's nothing to sign. There's no chant to learn. There's no hill to run up. There's no great thing you've got to do. And if you've not got this, you'd be like, Woohoo! Eternity, heaven, forever, mine, and I don't have to it's easy. He's done all the hard work. He's run up the mountain. He's descended into the depths. He has gone to a cross and paid for our sin. He did that great thing, the hard work, so for those of us, you and me, who realise we can't do it, can just say, thank you, Lord, you've done it for me, you've given a righteousness that I can't find on my own. Verse 11, as the scripture says, Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all. Here is a gospel that is big enough to get no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what other people may say about you, no matter how difficult you might find it to forgive yourself, Christ has done everything to get you and me in if only we would just wiggle our little tongue. And you know what? Religious people find that incredibly frustrating because they want it to be harder. They want to have some control over God in some way. And I suppose as we sit here, I just want you to know, please take this away with you, that nobody but nobody but nobody can accuse God of making it too hard to get in with him. Anyone can get in. Rich, poor, whoever you are, old, young, black, white, clever, not clever, Failure, successful, powerful, weak, whoever you are, Jesus is big enough to get us in, and he can do it. Do you see that? That's offensive to religious people who want to say, I can get myself in. He's made it too easy. So why didn't they want to come in? Well, was it that they just didn't hear this message? And that's the last point. He said there, point three. It wasn't they didn't hear it, it's that they just did not want to listen. So the question is, okay, if this is true, why is it that so many people are trying to get in with God because, uh, by their own efforts, is it that they would, nobody heard? Have a little look down at verse 14. 
How then can, can they call on the one they have not believed in and how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? That's a good point, isn't it? You need to hear the message, but a trust in it. And how can they hear without someone preaching it to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? So the big question is, is whether or not God has sent this message out. Because if he hasn't sent it out, it would be possible to argue that, well, that's, I'm okay in trying to get to God on my own. Now, admittedly, he's unpacked that argument in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and said that basically we all know deep down that we, treat, we haven't treated God as we should do and we know that we need his grace and mercy. So people can cry out from their hearts, say, Lord, God of the sky, who I have not treated as God, please will you find a way where I may be saved? And you tend to find that whenever you've got somebody who's got a heart like that, the Lord will find somebody who will go to them and give them the gospel. It could be you. It could be the you know somebody like that who hasn't yet heard. And what does God say? I'm sending you. Go and tell them. Tell them the message. God always sends his message to them so that they can hear. And how can they preach unless they ascend? Verse 15. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Was it that the religious people, the Jews, didn't hear God's message? In fact, that's a quote from the Old Testament. It's just coming up. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? They got the message, they just didn't want to listen. Do you get They got the message, that, but they didn't want to listen. And it's interesting, isn't it, that who was it who actually came to deliver the message? Was it just a messenger boy? Who stepped into the world, put on skin, put flesh on his body so that they could not mistake? He didn't just speak the message, he was the message. Who was it who came? See, some people say, I've got to make a stairway to heaven. And God says, no you don't. I will even come down to earth so that you can know me for yourself. So you can know I'm giving you the message clearly. And when Jesus turned up, and said to them, I am God's own son, come to make a way for you to be right with God. What did they say? Kill him! Because they didn't want to hear the message. In fact, that last verse, verse 21, it tells us a little bit about it. All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't ask us to climb the ladder. He said, I will come down and be the ladder so that you can be right with me. But the problem is, is you are obstinate and disobedient. There will be nobody who can say, God, you've been unkind to me. Because he said, anybody but anybody but anybody can come. And that's why some good people go to hell. And that's why some bad people can go to heaven. Because good people don't always want to listen. And bad people realise their stuff and say, you know, I'm prepared to listen. So can I just get personal just for a second? Can I ask you? Are you obstinate? Right now as you're listening, are you, can you sense yourself being stubborn? Are you committed to your self-salvation project? To pay your own way? And you're saying, Steve, well, I'm not quite sure. Help me to understand. Well, okay. Think back over the last, last 24 hours, the last 48 hours or so. Think about that. And think about your successes and failures. Do you feel yourself being drawn to either your successes or your failures as a way of beginning to feel like I'm just a little bit more acceptable before people and before God? Perhaps if you fail, you find it more difficult to come into church this morning. Perhaps you say to yourself, well, I don't know enough, or I've messed up, or if only you knew what I got up to. Or else, perhaps you're even saying something like this, well, I'm not a... I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not as bad as them down the road. And that's just code for, I'm okay, I can get myself in. If you feel your heart drawn to one of those two things, can I tell you there's a danger that you could be obstinate and and stubborn and saying, you know, I'm going to try and pay my own way. And if that is, and you can feel yourself that, then be honest with God in a minute when we get a chance to pray. Pray something like this, Lord, I don't want to depend upon your scandalous love. I don't want to but I know I need to and I find it hard. Would you help me? And in fact, that's the promise in these verses that there is help for people who are like that. If that is you today, there is help. Can you see it there? All day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. This is the character of God holding his hands out 
to obstinate and disobedient people. Now let me illustrate that for you so you just see what it looks like. I've told some of you this because I was telling the team about this this week, about one of the pivotal moments in my fatherhood experience was when we went to a wedding and Bethany was a bridesmaid. Do you remember that story to me? I told you that. And she loved to dance and she loved to sing and she was dressed up like a beautiful princess and she wanted to know how to do it. She wanted somebody to lead her across the dance floor. And I stood there all day standing by the dance floor with my arms open wide saying, she's not dancing. No. And she went and asked somebody else and maybe they danced with her for a little bit. I go back and say, she's not dancing. No. When I found somebody else, she danced with every other person in that room. She wouldn't dance with me. She just wouldn't. I was holding on. I, I loved her more than anybody else in that room. I was more committed to her than anybody else in that room. I was going to stick with her through thick and thin more than anybody else in that room. And the one person she didn't want, no, I'll do it myself. I'll find somebody. I want you to take that to a cross where it's less sanitized. Because here we're told that all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Those of you who know the scene of the cross at Easter know that it wasn't a dance and it wasn't a dad holding out his arms. But Christ climbed a hill carrying a cross and he was suspended between heaven and earth and all day long he held out his arms saying I will do anything I will do anything to stop you trying to save yourself please come to me look at what it costs me look at what it costs me please stop trying to do for yourself the only way that anybody goes to hell anybody at all is as Christ holds their, his arms out to them and saying no I will do it myself the sad thing is sometimes I speak to people and they say things to me like this. They say, Steve, I really do understand what you're saying. But I don't want Jesus to pay for my sin. I want to pay for it for myself. And in one way I walk away rejoicing because they've got the stakes. But on the other hand, I get, I'm desperate for them. So I finish just with the words of an old song. You'll know it. Weary, working and burdened one. Wherefore toil you so? Cease your doing, all was done long, long ago. Till to Jesus' work you cling by a simple faith. Doing is a deadly thing. Doing ends in death. Cast your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. Stand in him, in him alone gloriously complete. Let's pray together as Jane comes to the piano. Father, we want to pray that today you would forgive all our bad deeds, all our selfish motivation. But we pray too, Lord, you would forgive us those good things that we have done, that we have done in such a way as to try to get in with you. Forgive us for all the ways we try to be our own saviour. Forgive us all the ways we communicate to a world outside us that you're getting with God by being good. Please, Lord, help us to live as rescued and saved, righteous people. Help us, Lord, to cling, cling to that cross. Praise you, Lord, that you, for all day, hung on that cross and held your arms out to obstinate and disobedient people, and you did it that we might not be lost, but drawn to you. Please, Lord, help us to be humble. Lord, we want to depend on our own ability. We don't want to depend on your grace. Please help us to look at the cross and see all that you have done for us and cling to it. Please, Lord, help us to lay down our deadly doing, down at Jesus' feet, standing him in him alone and gloriously complete. Please help us, Lord. For we ask in his name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing together, and can it be? And this is a wonderful song of how God does it for us. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's love, that he does it for us? It talks about our soul's imprisonment before. It talks about our labours. 
And yet now we can sing about the fact that we are set free by His amazing grace. Let's stand and sing together.